very much. Thank you for the invitation. I was really honored to, to you know, be given this opportunity and, and just listen to a lecture like we just did. And I mean, I presume we're going to be saying similar things in some ways about uh, similar concepts. But I think what, what I can do, um, I can learn some of these things in practicalities because I come from an empirical background of seeing how some of these things that you just heard are playing out in, in clinical practice. And um, so I'd like to share, share that with you. And the, the title we came up with was, you know, from the trenches, what, what are we seeing? So I'll tell you, um, before I go into my disclosures, I'm not a bioethicist, I'm not a philosopher, I don't have a major in philosophy. I'm a hematologist, oncologist, and I've published extensively in my area of interest, my area of expertise, you know, in myeloma, myeloma-related genetic changes, clinical trials, etc. But then as I started seeing that progress, lots of little red flags started coming up into the horizon of what, what I was seeing for therapy and for the clinical practice. And I'd like to share a little bit of that with you. Now, like it's customary for, for medical practice, I wanna, I wanna present to you my, my disclosure of companies that I have uh, worked with. I've worked with a large number of companies, but I'll show you next why, and why this is so important. And also, I, I guess it would be fair to, to put here as well too, I'm, I'm a, a libertarian-minded person. I'm actually a visiting uh, healthcare fellow at the Goldwater Institute too as well, where we try to apply principle-based uh, discussion, dialogue, and, and communications Related, related to, uh, to healthcare, um, I, I actually hold a patent for fish in myeloma, so I make $2,000 a year. So if any of you is thinking about retiring with biomarker discovery, I would quit. Or, or maybe I'm not a very good negotiator. And, and, and last but not least, I just like wasting your time with a slide because I think it has no value. And I'll tell you how I started getting into this. So, um, you know, I, I started seeing, seeing all of this progress, and uh, I met a number of people, among them do, uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Tom Stossel, and we started talking about conflict of interest. And, and I realized, that was the first time that a little window opened to me, that there's what I call now a prevailing orthodoxy in medicine. And it was like so obvious that working with industry was so bad that how could you even question that? How could you even engage in debate? around that topic. And that's not the focus for my presentation today. I could do that some other time. And then as it turns out, he actually tried to submit a paper to various medical journals where, where he tried to prove that in fact this was the case. So he actually did a comparison of the medical literature between embryonic stem cell research, uh, at the time a very controversial topic because you know talking about embryonic stem cells versus conflict of interest. And, and his main proposal was that when you look at the papers that talk about stem cell, you often will find both sides. There's pros and cons. You talk about the pharmaceutical sector, it's 95% plus cons. So he did this formal analysis of the literature, submitted it to many journals, all of which rejected it, not on the basis of factual errors, but on the basis of cognitive dissonance. This cannot be true. We can just not accept a paper like this. Now, I myself have now lived through that with some of the publications, and this is part well, the beauty of the, the, the current world we have, actually, the ability to project ideas and to share ideas outside of the usual uh, channels and mechanisms that we have, that actually will be, will be more likely than not uh, be attuned to the uh, uh, conservation of this, this uh, orthodoxy. So, so I'll tell you a little bit about that. So I always like to show this slide as a physician painted in the 1860s. Look, the field's a, a you know, British painter, and it's really a beautiful painting where you see a physician caring for a, for a little girl there. And of course, she appears to be quite ill. In the background, you see the mother and the father trying to console her uh, with, a, with a lamp. They're trying to figure out what she has. And this painting is often used to denote uh, the humanistic aspects of medicine. And I'm sure you'll share that. And that's how we practice, and that's how we want to go and, and interact with our patients. However, uh, this physician is lacking something that is so important, and that is tools. This physician has no tools. So this little girl could be very easily dying from a strep throat that just got complicated and can do nothing for her. And, and we have seen such progress in medicine, I'm going to speak specifically about my field in, in, in recent years, that actually that uh, pace of discovery and that pace of change has been a major challenge to concepts surrounding the patient-physician uh, relationship, medical ethics, et cetera. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna start with that. First of all, I am a pathologic optimist. I like to put that two in my slide, and I like to think about hope. 
and I have been so fortunate to live in a field and to participate in the, the medical research on progress in myeloma where we can offer this to patients. When, when I was um, uh, starting on myeloma, uh, actually patients lived about two years. And now it's not unusual for us to have patients who are very long-term survivors, median survival in the excess of eight to 10 years. So we have changed dramatically the outcome for myeloma patients. And I'd like for that to happen for all diseases, of course. Now, if you, if you take a step back, just, just let me show you some data. This is what has happened over the last 100 years. The life expectancy in the 1900s was 48 years. Now it's closer to 80 years. But what's really interesting, if you start looking at the categories, you'll see some things that you know, almost make no sense to us. Now, of course, tuberculosis here. It's one of the key causes for death at the beginning of the past century. Now we're dealing with the things you know about cancer, heart disease, you know, cerebrovascular disorders, et cetera. And, and uh, when you kind of look at it, cancer accounts you know, for about the same burden of, of death uh, for patients as tuberculosis did close to 100 years ago. Now this is, this is where I work. This is the Mayo Clinic uh, Cancer Center building. This is located in Phoenix, Arizona. If you ever are out there and you want to visit it, let me know, I'd be happy to, to show you around. But here's my hope. My hope is that as we look back and we say maybe in 30 years, 20 years, 50 years, we go on, we, we, we are incredulous, and we say, can you believe those guys in 2018, they had cancer centers? It's like so primitive, right? I mean, who would think about having cancer centers? Well, as it turns out, people had sanatoriums for tuberculosis. Uh, the one on the left, you know, here in the United States, the one on the right is a hospital in Mexico that was uh, uh, built in the 1700s uh, for patients with tuberculosis, and that was one of the main uh, uh, public hospitals down there, but it's just, just hard for us to comprehend that one would build a hospital for tuberculosis. Now, not so long ago, we had the same experience with HIV and AIDS. So when I, when I was in training and uh, the, my residency training at the University of Miami, about a third of our admissions were for HIV-AIDS related complications. We in fact built buildings for those patients. It was a, a ward that was called a special immunology unit where you know, patients would go and be treated for PJP, crypto, et cetera. There were a number of diseases that you know, probably none of you will care for and hopefully you won't, but that's because of the progress that has been made uh, in the treatment of, of, of HIV. So let me tell you a little bit about myeloma. So myeloma, uh, if you probably, uh, most of you know this, but it's a disease that primarily affects uh, older adults. It's a cancer of the bone marrow. Every year, about 25,000 new patients are diagnosed with this. And, you know, patients present with bone pain, with fractures, a number of complications. And the list you see in the middle are 11 drugs that have been approved uh, by the FDA since 1999. Um, and the process has been messy. The process has been, in large part, empirical, a bit of serendipity. But the reality is all of these drugs have dramatically changed the outcome for patients, and they have improved their survival. How so? Well. Let me show you, this is a, a study, we actually just published this a few months ago, looking at survival of myeloma. Um, and I'll tell you a little side story, which is really, really cool. If you're interested in big data, this is what's called real world analysis. So we took a claims database from uh, Truven Analytics, which has anonymized data on patients on, on insurance claims. And we actually did the study with close to 10,000 patients. It's hard to do that with, with most academic centers. And we looked at, in blue, you see the, the myeloma survival, and you see if we break it down by year of diagnosis, 06, 07, 08, 09, 10 to 12, it's, it, you know, it's creeping upwards towards what would be the control survival for uh, a control group in that insurance claims database. So we're getting a lot better. And as I mentioned, many of those patients can now live close to eight uh, to 10 years. And I can tell you for sure, the reason the curves are going up is not because hematologists are smarter or because our white coats are wider. It is because of the tools. It is because of the ability we have that we can provide treatment that is effective for this patient. So I, I used to say that when I started in myeloma, um, you know, if you, if you were doing myeloma, you were the last in line. You were, everyone wanted to do lymphoma and leukemia, and those were kind of the, the, the interesting areas. Myeloma, we had two drugs that were called melphalan and prednisone. Maybe some of you have heard about melphalan. It's a very old chemotherapy drug, and it's rarely used uh, at least in the United States, and that will be relevant. So I always say, I'm, you know, I'm, I've been one of the ants that has been part of this, and there's many ants. There's probably thousands of people that have participated from the physician side, from the nursing side, 
um, study coordinators, um, um, you know, basic scientists, etc. And I think at the end of the day, everyone's going to try to describe themselves. I was a stronger ant. I was a critical ant. I was the one who could bridge the thing. But it's just an ant bridge, and and it's just been a pleasure to be part of that. So, so as I see this and I interact with patients over the last five to ten years, I told you there's a few um, little sort of red flags that have come to, to, to the forefront that I do see as challenges and I do see them as a threat for this continued improvement, this continued um, improvement in the survival we have and having better tools. And in fact, as I mentioned before, I would like for this to be a reality for, for, for all patients. Now it's not. If, if you work in Alzheimer's, Pfizer just announced they're gonna stop further clinical research in the search for Alzheimer drugs because it's just too risky, it's too hard. People are losing money in doing that. Of course, if you had a drug, wow, everyone would be so happy and Pfizer stakeholders would be so happy with that, but it's very hard. So they have effectively decided to discontinue that. So, so in, in, in a process and in a road that's already challenging as treaters, you need to have kind of the continued momentum to be able uh, to move forward. Now, I won't, I won't expand too much on this because I think you just, you just heard about this, but I, when I started in the conflict of interest, there was this idea of the fiduciary responsibility to the physician that perhaps those that are working with industry like myself were really not, um, you know, we were not good fiduciary uh, 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 stewards for, for patients because there was a potential, a potential that has never been proven objectively, but there's a potential that some of these considerations could actually cloud our thought process perhaps um, you know would allow us to become uh, sellers of snake oil never proven however it's a potential but what you just heard is that if you introduce into this triangle of responsibilities the concept of society kind of there's a lot of medical literature that says you should consider that so it's not a potential anymore it's almost like a mandate and there's multiple papers that I see in my field, in my lab, when we start talking about pharmacoeconomics, the cost of drugs, etc., that say we have to consider societal priorities. Uh, society is uh, now a player that's supposed to come in this triangular fashion into what I personally consider should be the sacred relationship between the physician and the patient. And I think you, you've heard about this quite eloquently before, so I won't, I won't uh, elaborate too much more on this, but just to say that when, when you are at the bedside, I really love the word novels because I, I think, you know, I have my clinic predominantly on Tuesdays. And I can tell you, I walk into that clinic with a little bit of extra pep. It's my favorite day of the week. It's hard. I'll get out there late. But, but the ability to, to engage with patients in such a meaningful way, it's as rewarding as anything else that I can think. And in fact, I realize my research and some of the research that I have done may have um, a greater impact. You know, some of the research we've done with drugs will help someone else down the line, will help patients that are not seen in our clinic. But the depth of the m and the meaning of that relationship we have in the clinic is really something that keeps us going forward and keeps us uh, moving. Now, let me tell you about the vectors of tension. So you're going to hear about this all the time. I mean, we all hear about this. You know, physicians that cry, oh my God, there's like direct to patient, you know, advertising and this is so wrong. And you know, pharma is corrupt, et cetera. And, and so I, I don't even want to, you know, repeat what you're going to hear incessantly in, 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 in most uh, medical communications. But I'm going to suggest to you to start paying attention to a few things because there is no doubt that the private sector has its interest. And, and we should be skeptical. We should be stringent. We should be the ones who are driving whether a drug or a device or a new procedure belongs in the clinic. But you should not lose sight that there's interest also from the other side, from the payers. I'm going to start with choosing wisely. I've always been bothered by this. Choosing wisely is a campaign that um, has been uh, espoused by the American Board of Internal Medicine, which is all about the via negativa. It's all about doing less. I agree with everything they say. But it's always been suspect to me that there's nothing that reminds us in choosing wisely you should not forget to do this for your patients. So yes, we shouldn't do CT scans if we don't need them. We shouldn't you know, treat with antibiotics that come on cold. We shouldn't treat with antibiotics bronchitis that is uncomplicated. But what about providing preventive medicines for patients who are on chemotherapy? I've never seen that in choosing wisely. So as time has gone by, and I, I will suggest to you, if you pay attention, you're going to start seeing some of this flag. So choosing wisely is exclusively focused 
on the Via Negativa. There's a RAND study that looked at medical interventions. Now, again, if you just take the mainstream message, it would be that there's overuse, there's waste, we're wasteful in the United States, we do too many things. Well, there's a third party study that has documented that underuse is by three to one a much bigger problem than overuse. I just reviewed the literature for myeloma for, for a claims database saying, okay, you know, in the recent years, how many of the myeloma patients that are out there in the community are getting the best drugs? We can, we can objectively determine that. It's still not the majority of patients. There's a large fraction of patients that are getting older or suboptimal treatments. So I would suggest to you that choosing wisely is also doing the right thing. One of the little red flags. Now, part of these vectors for, what I call vectors for tension, come from this very rapid pace and the high cost of some of the interventions and medications. And it all resides on this asymmetry of information that has existed in medicine for, for, the, you know, for the past several decades. So physicians, we were guardians of the information. You know, we had it in books, we had it in medical journals, and certainly it was in, uh, in such a language that it could only be interpreted for patients by physicians. But of course, that's not the case anymore. Patients will come to you and will meet you in your offices with very sophisticated and detailed analysis of their medical condition. And I will suggest to you that they can get to the level that they can propose alternatives to what you may be proposing for treatment that are going to be logical and sound. How so? Well, as it turns out, I think in medicine, a lot of what, what we have done is focus on information, is focus on memory, and somewhat recently over the past 20 years, on algorithms. We then use that information and apply it for a given situation. But if you have a patient who already has a specific diagnosis, let me go back to myeloma, a very informed patient can come to me. This is the most recent study. By the way, it's not even published. It's an abstract that came out at one of your scientific meetings. What do you think about this? Does this apply to me or not? And I tell patients, you know, I'm your counselor. I'm, I will provide you my interpretation for that. We'll jointly, jointly make that decision of where we're going to go. Now, the way I divide some of this tension is between the individual, which I'm going to call it just the American way, versus the group, which is the European way. Now, I have many colleagues who treat myeloma patients in European countries, and I can tell you they leave us in the dust when it comes down to very large clinical trials. If you're doing a phase three clinical trial, they'll do them in nine months. How so? Well, you go to their physician offices by their recollection, by their recount, and they go like, well, I'm doctor so-and-so, this is what we're gonna do. The American way is more nuanced, is more detailed, is longer, and is highly respectable of the individual uh, choice. So it, it's focused more on self-determination, and I'm gonna uh, go as far as say it's paternalistic. And there's a very recent um, editorial uh, by um, uh, Dr. Topol looking at paternalism in medicine. I would highly recommend you read that. Because I think as we're uh, diminishing this asymmetry of information, I think more and more we should be focusing on self-determination. And also, of course, because of the morality of the choice that you just heard before, uh, before me. And of course, this is more of the private and, and, and the public. Now, you might say, well, it shouldn't be that hard, right? I mean, we have great tools. For instance, evidence-based medicine is one of the greatest tools that we now have to apply to our practice. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, the, the problem with this is, and, and you'll, you'll learn this as you go through your rotations and your practice, evidence-based medicine can only provide conclusive evidence for a very small sliver of what we do in medicine. The day-to-day -day practice is more nuanced. Again, it's messy, it's chaotic, and it's a little bit more individualized. So I recently wrote in one of my papers kind of this uh, two extremes of, of how people are thinking about medicine. So, uh, there's, there's a very famous poem by this Argentinian poet called Borges about this guy who's doing a map you know, for the king, and the king says, well, it's not good enough. So they insist and they insist, so the maps get larger and larger until there's a point where the cartographer cannot tell the map from reality. So they're so precise and so good, you cannot tell the map from reality. And I think that's what we, I would like that, and that's what evidence-based medicine proponents would like. But of course, that's not possible. If we Think about myeloma, 11 new drugs, you start doing simple arithmetic. You think about different stages of the disease, different genetic subtypes, dosage and administration. The number of clinical trials that we would have to do that would be in the scores of thousands. It's simply something that can't be done. Cooperative groups, for instance, in the United States can maybe run three trials per year. The Europeans can run two or three tri trials per year. So we have to do the best with information we have. So that's why I call this other group, which are the pioneers, it's a little bit more empirical. 
and a lot of what we have done in medicine has been through this process of, of, of pioneer. Now, don't take this as me saying evidence-based medicine is not useful. In fact, everything should be moving towards this part of the slide. But in fact, a lot of what we do is on the left side of the, the slide. And if, if, you, if you like reading about Taleb, he kind of makes the distinction between the Romans and the Greek, the hypothetical and the empirical. People were building churches before they knew how to build churches. And then they go back and they describe, oh, this is how we build churches. But in fact, they just had empirical knowledge of how those churches were being built. Now, as we bring innovation to the, pay, to the bedside, are we hearing patients? And these are some of the terms, I'm going to expand on some of them in a second, that are common parlance now as, as people talk about this physician and patient uh, relationship. For instance, at the very top, you'll see off-label. Off-label is often used with this pejorative you know, sort of tone of like, well, people are using off-label medications. In fact, just yesterday, there were a bunch of articles talking about off-label. Well, it turns out off-label cures patients. Children were cured with off-label protocols. Some of the patients that I treat with a condition called amyloidosis, light chain amyloidosis, can be cured with off-label utilization of medications. In the field of oncology, about 50% of our interventions proven by evidence-based medicine clinical trials are essentially uh, on the, on the off-label category. Financial toxicity, something else. You know, is that something that it's uh, important for patients? Of course it's critically important. If any of us were diagnosed with cancer, you know, that's a major financial challenge. And in fact, there's some studies that show that you double the risk of having bankruptcy if you have a cancer diagnosis. The difference is between 0.7 and 1.7% by those studies. Now, Say that again, slower. 0.7 to 1.7. So right. even though it doubles it, right. it's a very small number. It's like doubling the risk of Lyme disease. Now, I won't minimize the impact that a cancer diagnosis has on a patient or on a family. But just think about it for a second. What happens? You can't work. You maybe don't have a lot of savings. Someone needs to drive you to the appointment so your caregiver can't work. Sometimes you have to travel to a center, like a center like this. I'm sure there's people that come from rural communities, have to spend nights in the hotels, have to spend money on meals. And yes, they have copays, but not only for drugs, they have copays for the hospital, this hospital, for doctor offices, et cetera. So it's a very, com you know, it's a very, um, um, uh, it's a multifactorial thing. So it's really, really important that this is, this is uh, you know, uh, spelled out in great detail. Now, one of my favorite topics, and I'm going sort of down this rabbit hole, I'd like to take, tell you about copays and that, how that relates to what we're talking here about self-determination, patient autonomy, and morality. If you read the, the, again, mainstream medical literature, they'll tell you a bankruptcy happens in cancer patients, and there's almost like an unquestionable syllogism that is because of the cost of the drugs and the copays associated with these drugs, which I, I just told you is, has never been proven in any, any uh, specific study. Now, when you look at patients who have commercial insurance in the United States, anyone who's under the age of 65 with commercial insurance can usually get, get copay assistance coupons. So they get a coupon and many of the patients that you know, will receive medications that will cost eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month, sometimes very expensive medications, will end up paying $25. Now, I can tell you, I've heard stories of people that go on the radio and they go, oh, people are having to sell their homes because of the copays associated with medications. Certainly not under 65. How about over 65? Well, it turns out that Medicare, just like the case you heard, because of stark laws, prevents pharmaceutical companies from directly providing copay assistance to patients. So what patients have to do is they would either have to pay out of pocket, with very few patients would have the means to afford all of that, or they have to go through a third party like the Leukemia Lymphoma Society or patient support organizations that will give them copay assistance that, by the way, comes from the pharmaceutical company in this triangulated, so it's just a game. It's sort of a, a phony system, it's just a game. Now, the reason that exists, and, and this is where I, I, I want to go, the reason that exists is to de-incentivize the use of expensive medications. But I'll tell you, for cancer, sometimes there's just one drug, it's under patent, and there's really no benefit that can be discerned from just making it hard for patients to have access to these medications. In fact, I am surprised that no bioethicist has called this out, that they're putting this consumerism pressure in patients who are facing an end-of-life you know, diagnosis, obviously a very vulnerable population, just with an aspiration that there's a little bit less of that drug use. I find that completely wrong. 
um, and immoral. And in fact, uh, that could be very simply fixed if regulations would allow for single source medications, so patented medications, to be treated just like we do that for commercial patients. Furthermore, there's uh, many studies by economists that have shown that this is a system that doesn't work and there's, there's modeling for this. I won't go into that. So, so, so again, when we start thinking about society and we start thinking about you know, how do we administer money and funds, um, uh, this, this can take very perverse uh, paths. I won't talk to you about this a lot, but I'm, I'm, I am actually a supporter of the right to try legislation. Why? Just because we sh I, I, I start from the premise, you know better what's good for you. I, I think I know better what's good for me. I will make mistakes in that process, but I will respect your autonomy in making those choices. And even if the right to try, which is one of, one of the, the, the weakness of this legislation and the argument, even if the right to try does not practically result in hundreds of thousands of patients receiving medications that they don't have access to, it should, st should stand just on the moral grounds alone, on the principle that you should be able to, to be part of that self-determination. And you know what's interesting? Some of the people that oppose right to try support you know, uh, the, the, the idea that a person should have the right to end their life. So how can you allow someone that you know, elects to end their life and they say, but you shouldn't try these things which can give you toxicity. What's the ultimate toxicity? Obviously, it's death. So there's, there's this uh, uh, intellectual inconsistency as we think through, through some of this process. Again, I won't go into all the details of right to try, but I support that. Um, I, I, um, I talked uh, already about advertising, genetic testing. I'll tell you, genetic testing is beautiful. And there's so many people that hate 23andMe right now. You know, and, and it's predictable. In medical journals, people are going to say, oh, 23andMe doesn't really serve a purpose. Personalized medicine is a waste, etc." I, I think we need to move on from that mentality. I'll tell you a beautiful story about, about genetic testing and direct to consumer. So I have an 11 month old baby. Um, and when my wife found out uh, she was pregnant, she decided she wanted to know early on the sex of the baby. So, so what she do, she went online. I didn't know any of this. No, I didn't have to know it, but it's, 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 it's germane to the story because I'm a physician. So she went online, found this company that sends her a kit home. She pricks her finger, puts a few drops of blood in a tube. And by the way, there's instructions there that uh, you know, there should be no males in that room. She sends this, this kit, and a few days later, we get a beautiful email that tells us you're having a boy. How do they do that? Well, they did that through um, um, uh, uh, circulating fetal DNA. So as long as you have 3% circulating fetal DNA, they can run PCR for genes in the Y chromosome. If it's positive, you have a boy. If it's negative, you have a girl. Well, this has now been expanded to the point that you actually can do testing for aneuploidy, for instance, for, for Down syndrome. And you know what's really interesting? So this was done by a lay person, not a physician. It was not covered by insurance. It cost $100. And as we, as we told, talk to the obstetrician, the obstetrician said, oh yeah, well, you can do the one for aneuploidy. But guess what, if you pay for it yourself, it's cheaper than the copay you're gonna pay if you send this through your insurance company. I'm sure you've heard about this, this stories in other scenarios. But anyway, I think there's a lot of value. I myself have had my full genome sequence and on another occasion I'll tell you, <laughs> tell you the details. Uh, quality, I'm gonna expand on quality in my next slide. I, th I think we're okay for time. And then, um, and then one of the things that, that I don't think we talk enough is physicians, particularly in oncology, I'm going to, again, remain focused on oncology, they often will say, oh, this is what's important for patients. This is what patients want. And I ask them, how do you know? There's very important and interesting work now being done by patient and patient support organizations that tell us what are the things that are important for patients. So physicians will immediately assume that overall survival is what matters for patients. I think it stands to reason we all want to live for longer. But actually, patients have different hopes. You know, when patients are shown survival curves and they're given, okay, you know, would you rather be in the median of the curve if you have certainty, or would you rather gamble and you're on the end of the curve, say, for someone who gets cured with a specific therapy, um, three out of four patients will choose the latter choice. So we focus on the median survival and the increment the number of months and progression-free survival. Patients see things in a different way. Patients see things from uh, the perspective of landmarks. You know, can I, can I be healthy enough that I can attend the wedding, I can see a new you know, child be born into the family and so forth. But let me go back to quality. Quality is really interesting because I think this. Do, do you guys know what quality stands for? Quality. 
Right. Uh, so I'll, okay. So, so quality is uh, quality is an acronym for quality adjusted life years, and what it is is a metric that is used by multiple studies, and I would say the majority of studies that look at pharmacoeconomics, where they actually um, provide a value for a year of life for a for a person for a patient, and and what it ends up being is that um, people who do this analysis in the pharmacoeconomics field will say. Well, you know, if you have cancer and let's say you had a big surgery and then you have pain because of the surgery, then the quality of the year that you have after that surgery is going to be less than the quality of that year if you were healthy. And that's fine, you know, that's what medical literature does. And then patients again raise their hands and they said, is that so? If I ask you, you know, what are you planning for the next six months? You might say, well, I don't know, I'm going to finish my course and then I have to do this. But if you ask a cancer patient, what are you doing for the next, next six months? I can tell you they're going to have very specific answers. I, I would really like to take a trip. I want my sister to come here. So patients are telling us, if anything, the, qu the quality and the importance of that period of time after a cancer diagnosis, we could argue is more valuable. Let's not put it more valuable, but let, let's not decrease it by, by, by quality. Now. Um, in, through some of the blog writings, and I can share some of this too as well um, uh, later if, if that's okay, quality should never be used to deny care. Uh, there's, there's several um, uh, bioethicist write-ups about this. The quality was really the sign in the idea that if you have two equivalent treatments, this would be a way that would allow you to you know, decide between those two. And, and we have a few things in medicine where you have two things that are very, very similar. Maybe most proton pump inhibitors, maybe some of the analgesics. But as you get into the high-end medications, there is almost never a situation where two drugs are the same. There's always trade-offs. Some are a little bit better, some are a little bit more toxic in some way than others. And, and that's what we need to bring when we're doing those, those clinical decisions, not the quality. So it should not be used to, to, to the night care. It is actually something that leads to discrimination because you know, if you start thinking, okay, so if quality just values the, 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 the quantity of and the, and the quality of that life, well, it just would happen that, you know, quality would tell us that we should um, allocate healthcare dollars to children. In fact, it would tell us that we should not allocate uh, healthcare dollars for, for family planning because, you know, the prevention of births will be contrary to the principles of quality. There's a beautiful article written in 1987 by, by this fellow, Harris which tries to uh, cover all of the um, ethical aspects of, of, uh, of using quality as a metric. And a common thing that people say, okay, well, you don't like the quality. What should we use instead? And the reality is that the absence of an alternative that has been accepted and validated doesn't by, you know, by, by itself provide you know, moral qualifications for us using the quality, which is a very, very important um, uh, concept. So again, I, I don't pretend to come here to you knowing what the answers are to any of these problems. And in fact, my, my only goal of coming here was at least to raise some awareness for you to think about some of these issues that sometimes are just given for granted as, as, we, uh, as we see the medical literature. Now to um, the next step, what about payers? So, you know, you hear all these things about fee for service versus value base. And, um, you know, that's uh, obviously important because there's the possibility of waste and fee for service. We know that. And, you know, in fact, my institution sometimes will use that. Well, you know, here our physicians are salaried, so you're not going to get a knee replacement if you don't need it, um, um, et cetera. But, and, and, and we can agree that there have been abuses of fee for service. But you seldom hear about the risks of value based propositions, which there are many terms for. And the way I explain it when I engage in conversations about this is like an all-inclusive hotel. Now, if you want a drink, you're not going to get the choice of what you want. Okay, now this is very pedestrian, of course. But the value-based system, even though they're supposed to reach same qualities, are really incentivized to do less. The fee-for-service, there's an incentive to do more because if there's a fraction of that cost that becomes income for the physician, of course, we're incentivized to do more. But the value base is also incentivized to do less. Now, I'll give you examples. There's some closed health systems where physicians are told not to discuss stem cell transplant for myeloma, uh, a, a, a treatment for myeloma. Now, that's a standard of care. And, and I love that. If, if you couldn't tell that directly to the patient, you know, I, I think we're not passing the test of morality there. You probably uh, have heard recently, there was a big article in the New York Times about pharmacists not being able to tell patients 
that they would pay less if they paid cash because of the contracts they have with one, some of the, the, the PBM uh, contracts they have. Uh, let me jump to step therapy. So step therapy is, uh, is something that uh, payers would like to impose in certain pathways for the treatment of conditions. And more often than not, what it means is use an older therapy before you try the more expensive new one. Now, sometimes that's reasonable. You know, if, if you have hiccups, maybe try some cold water. If you, if you have a cold, let's try Sudafed. Let's not jump into more uh, complicated things. But in the case of cancer, this often will expose patients to risks that they should not be exposed. So if you take that to the case of myeloma, there's a medication that we use. It's called uh, lenalidomide. The commercial name is Revlimid which is a second generation thalidomide. I can tell you the step therapies apply throughout the world in other health systems. So throughout the world, my colleagues still use a lot of thalidomide. It turns out that thalidomide causes a complication of peripheral neuropathy in 100% of the patients that take that thalidomide. And if it was up to some payers, they would like for us to start with thalidomide. And then if there's no peripheral neuropathy, keep going. If there is, then maybe let's switch to lenalidomide. The goal of that is to minimize the expense that you know, the, the payers would, would incur. And that's what, what also is built into this thing with pathways and incentives. And, and you know, people are incentivized to, to stick to those pathways. Sometimes they make sense. Sometimes uh, you know, 10 people around the room, 10 oncologists can say, this is the right thing to do. This is what we're going to do. But there's always that risk, of course, of the incentive in the opposite direction. Um, I'll tell you about, uh, about one of the approval bodies in one of my last slides um, um, uh, that's called ICER, but you've heard about this, for instance, from NICE. And now we, we fortunately have gotten rid of this thing called the, the IPAP, which was an, an unelected body that was going to exist here in the United States to determine whether paying for a medication was appropriate or not. Again, that's a whole topic of, 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 of for another day. Now, ICER, ICER is, is one of these this, uh, independent institutes, and, and they call themselves independent, although they, they're supported by pharmaceutical companies, but they're supported by payers, they're supported by um, foundations that would have an interest in trying to decrease the cost of care for patients with cancer. So they recently did a review for, for the disease, again, I deal with for myeloma. And, um, you know, I, I had to watch five hours of the video as they were deliberating on what they were going to say. And oftentimes, you know, five years from now, people could say or could write, oh, there's an independent group called ICER that made these recommendations. And I don't think many of my colleagues in my home have watched those five hours. Two of them were sitting in the audience. They didn't watch the whole thing, but they were sitting in, in, in the audience physically when the, when the meeting was happening. And anyone who deals with myeloma patients would be shocked to hear what was being said during this meeting as they were making selections for what may be the proper treatment for for myeloma patients, and it was all primarily based on how to reduce costs. During this meeting, two things happened that were, that were fascinating in, in a very negative way. One of them was there was someone who's, who told a story, you know, for a disease, again, myeloma, where you can live eight to 10 years. They said, well, you know, it's becoming problematic. It's so expensive now with the scopase. I just heard of someone who just selected to go to hospice after diagnosis because after all, you would not overcome the disease. It's happened more than once. It's not a disease where we would ever recommend a person goes to hospice. Of course, if they want to do that, I would respect their self-determination, but it's not a classical scenario for recommending hospice. Number two, one of the persons who was uh, voting in the panel where they were, you know, the interventions were good or bad, uh, before they started the voting, raised his hand and he said, you know, no matter how much data you show me and how much quality of the data you show me, I'm just gonna vote that they're not of value. Because I personally believe that the money that's being spent on myeloma should be, really be used for schools and roads and other things. And everyone's like, fine, okay, so you're gonna vote no. Flip that 180 degrees and imagine that someone from pharma was sitting at that table and raised their hands and says, no matter how toxic they are or how little improvement they provide in the survival for a patient, I'm just gonna vote yes because I'm from pharma. And everyone's like, okay, sure, go ahead and do that, right? <laughs> Just, just think about those things. So when five years from now someone hears about ICER, I want to make sure it's very clear in the memory of those invoking that, that this is not the best recommendation for the treatment for a myeloma patient. So how do we move forward? Uh, I think I live by what, what Mayo has taught me. I'm a lifer at Mayo, so I'm very biased. So I, the needs of the patient come first. I believe that today's best is not good enough. We need to continue to, 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 to move forward. And I think we're a combination away or a drug away from being able to cure a much larger uh, uh, fraction of our patients. You already heard about transparency and honesty. 
Um, I'd like to suggest that we as physicians really owe it to ourselves and to our patients to have that intellectual depth. I just heard yesterday, you know, someone was saying critical thinking. When did thinking become critical? Thinking has always been thinking, right? It's like, it's like an oxymoron. But I think we really have a responsibility to keep engaged in this intellectual uh, dialogue and also that we live in a real world. And as I said before, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really tainted by this optimism. Last night I was listening to, to a lecture by Steve Pinker who was talking at the Cato Institute and he kind of puts the four uh, pillars of, of the enlightenment of reason, science, humanism and progress. And that's what I have seen in my field and I would hate for that to go away because of some abstract considerations of like we're going to bankrupt society. We've made a lot of progress, we just cannot let it down. And with that, I, I, will, I will finish. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. So we finished with five minutes for questions. So Dr. Fonseca, was it yesterday? No, two yeah. days ago you were in Paris? Last, yesterday. <laughs> yesterday. And twisted his schedule around so he could get here. And then he's leaving this afternoon to go to Florida because he's got something else going on. So this is your only opportunity to ask him a question. So let's take five minutes of questions for Dr. Fonseca. Then we'll have a very short, as short as you can make it, um, break to go to the bathroom. And the bathrooms are go out the door, go to the right. Men, you're on the right. Girls, go a little bit further. Out the hallway, go right. It's right past the elevator. OK? So any questions for Dr. Fonseca? In sole disagreement allowed, of course. <laughs> Tomatoes as well. Yeah. Somewhat curious about uh, your paradigm on fiduciary duty. Sure. Um, in terms of that being the highest standard of care, um, a lot of people see uh, a money market like that in the traditional fiduciary duty sure. that the financial advisor has to their patient as something that's zero sum because mm -hmm. money taken from somewhere um, essentially has to be taken from somewhere, Rob, Peter, PayPal, or whatever it may be. Sure. Whereas a lot of people would rather think of health as something um, that if you maximize it for one person, it actually might positively affect everyone um, around them. And you don't have to take it from one person uh, to give to someone else. So well, how did you arrive at that perception? Um, there's, there's, there's a bunch of things. One of, one of them, first of all, who decides for what's a proper payment for a service, right? And oftentimes people start with this zero-sum game uh, perception. They think, like, there's this much cash on this table. How do we distribute that? Well, that never exists because the cash never gets to that table. So how it really is implemented in, in reality is who's responsible for the ultimate payment for that. Now, sometimes it is governments, as is um, in the public systems, uh, say, Canada. Sometimes it's uh, the payers of a commercial insurance company. In some cases, like in my case, it's my employer, my employer self-insured. I don't want to delegate that responsibility to someone else. And the closer that person is to me, the better it is. And that's why I think, I, I strongly believe, for instance, in direct primary care for, for routine things, because, because you're very close to that, to that dollar. Now, having said that, some of these things are still very expensive. So you, so, so you, so you have to consider, you know, how do we distribute those costs? Well, when you talk about expense, you also need to talk about value. And there's a very interesting paper that was published by this person named Lagdwala that said, you know, if, if you look at the expenses, you cannot do that, that balance sheet without talking about the economic benefit of that. For cancer, older drugs, so the period of 1998 until 2000, about 85% of the economic benefit was realized by patients. Only 15% went into profits and revenue for, for companies. For myeloma, with these very expensive drugs, it's almost a zero-sum game right now. So, so that's how I, I justify it. And I think, I think one of the points that was, that was uh, made before is that when you're at the bedside or when you're in your, your, your office and doing that consult, you shouldn't have the cap of policymaker, you shouldn't have the cap of the pharmacy manager or those decisions. Your only cap should be the one that, um, and, and, and that's where you use fiduciary, I'm gonna try to do for you what's the best that I think will help you um, overcome or you know, get better from, from what you're suffering. That's kind of how. how. So, um, in the, it, if you've got questions, come on up so we can give people time to go to the bathroom. So you've got 10 minutes. Get back here at 10 up, okay? But he's going to be around. If you want to use your 10 minutes to ask a question, please come up. Thank you. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, guys.